We're going to start this lecture with the question, how many different breeds of dog are there? So this may be a little bit different than what we've been talking about, but actually it isn't. It's related to exactly what, we, what we've been talking about, genetics. How many different breeds of dog out there? Well, if you think about it for a moment, there's a bunch of different kinds. There's things that look like this or sort of wolf-like, husky-like, and there's these, these ones that are sort of short and stubby with a black face, and these guys that look like dogs that can retrieve sticks, and of course that one can, and here's the husky. This is an example of a Siberian husky with the ice blue eyes and all of that. And then we have dogs that look like this with way too much skin on their face. And then we have dogs that are really clever and know how to get out of water. And we have dogs that know how to run through water. And we get ugly dogs. And we get dogs that play piano. So how many different types of dog are there? If there's all these different kinds of dog, we know there's more than one breed of dog. Well, there is a group that actually keeps track of all of this. And it's the American Kennel Club. And the American Kennel Club recognizes about 150 different breeds of dog. Okay, so there's just in the United States, represented of U.S. breeds, about 150. Whereas if you go to other kennel clubs, other countries have their own kennel clubs and they have different breeds of dog. The, the, not all breeds of dog are just from one place. If you look at all of the different dog breeds that are recognized by all the different kennel clubs around the world, the number you get is around 400. Okay, so we have 400 different kinds of dog breed. Now, here's a question. Where did they come from? Where did all these dog breeds come from? All right, well, you probably know the answer that it's related somehow to descending from wild dogs, from essentially wolves. Okay, but here's a question. Are we saying, therefore, that if we were to go out into the wild, say, 100,000 years ago, 200,000 years ago, we would have found a wolf pack with dogs that look like this or like this. There's little chihuahua, packs of chihuahua wolves running around. Obviously, that's not what we're saying. And that obviously also is not what happened. So how can we reconstruct that, though? How do we know what happened? Well, what we can do is this. We can look at the genes of every one of these dogs and look at how they're related to each other. You may have heard of this. We do this in people all, all the time nowadays. In fact, there's a company, 23andMe, that does that, that looks at the genes and sees where all of these different genes come from. So you can determine, for example, whether your genes came from Africa or from Asia or from Europe and even specific parts, even specific cities sometimes. Well, we can do that with dogs as well. We can take the dog breeds and, uh, and other dogs, even mutts, that are mixed, and we can look at their genes and we can trace those back. And what's interesting is this, if we trace all of those back, every single breed of, draw, of dog that we've ever done this to, every single one, traces its lineage not to modern wolves, but to an ancestral population of wolves that existed in Eurasia. Now, the majority seem to have come from Central Asia, some from the Near East instead of the Far East, and some from even Siberia and some European areas. There's also some genes that are mixed into some uh, breeds in North America from North American wolves, but very few, not very many at all. Almost all of them come from Eurasia. So all of these dogs here, like this little corgi right there, that corgi traces its lineage from parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, however many greats, traces that lineage all the way back to a species of wolf. So here's the question. How in the world do we do that? How did we take this creature that looks like this and make it into a corgi? So how did this happen? How is it that this corgi came from a wolf? What mechanism could do that? Ladies and gentlemen, that mechanism is human beings. We did this. We created this corgi and we did this from a wolf. How in the world do you change a wolf into a corgi? Well, we didn't do that. We didn't change one wolf into a corgi. That's not how it happened. What we did is we took a population of wolves and changed them into all of the corgis that exist on the planet today. So how do we know we did this? Because we did it. We watched ourselves do it. So there's no question that this corgi came from 
us doing something with an ancestor, ancestral wolf population and making the corgi. The technique that we used, and we, again, we know we use this technique, is artificial selection. Now it's called selection because literally what, what happened in, in the past was that individuals who owned dogs would breed the dogs that had the traits that they liked either traits of personality, although that's probably how it started, and traits are physical traits, the way they looked, the way they behaved, and things like this. So we selected who bred with whom. And it's artificial because it's human beings doing that. So that's the concept. Artificial selection is simply something we know very well. All of our domestic breeds of, do of animal, dogs, cats, cows, sheep, horses, pigs, all of those things came from this process. And again, we know how it works. In fact, we even practiced. There was a, a study, a really famous study, that was done in Russia. Actually, the Soviet Union is in partially in Estonia and elsewhere, where they domesticated foxes. They took standard foxes that were living in, the, in that area of northern uh, Eurasia, and they had uh, captive ones. And there was one that was really friendly and nice and happy, and they loved that. That one seemed to be very affectionate towards human beings. And so they started breeding for affection towards humans. And they were able to, within a few generations, get essentially a domesticated breed of fox from wild foxes. What was interesting about that, though, is that more than just the personality changed, the coat color also changed. And a number of other factors, things that uh, they weren't selecting for changed as well. So the, and including floppy ears and things like this. So what's interesting then is when we focus on a particular trait and select for it, we inadvertently change other traits. What that tells us is that the genetics of all of these things are intertwined, they're interconnected. But again, the point is this, we did all of this. We started with a wolf population that we domesticated probably based on the ones that were most likely to come to our fires when we were cooking food or things like this. We domesticated those, bred those together, started breeding for the traits we wanted, and then we end up with these things. But how long did that take? I mean, did it take just two, three generations? No, obviously not. But how long did it take? Well, we can figure that out. We can figure out how long those genetic changes took. And it's tens of thousands of years. Only, I mean, only tens of thousands. That's a long time, tens of thousands of years. Many, many human generations, many, many, even more dog generations. But tens of thousands of years is not even remotely long compared to the length of time that the Earth has been around. Okay, So keep that in mind. What's important is to realize that this happened in tens of thousands of years, yet we could have been doing this for millions of years, although we haven't been around that long. We could have been doing it for 100 million years. The Earth is that old. We could have been doing it for over a billion years. The Earth is old enough. So that's the key point. We did all of this. We made all these different breeds of dog. We did it. All right, so now consider the following two breeds of dog. This thing right here, this gigantic thing, is, I believe, an Irish elk hound or Irish wolfhound. It's huge. This thing could weigh up to 200 pounds. This thing here is a little teacup chihuahua, and it's just a little tiny thing. That's a Coke can that gives you a sense of the size of this thing. This is a little teeny tiny dog. Okay, now, these dogs, both of them, we know from this previous argument here, they came from wolves. Through artificial selection, we created this and this from essentially the same wolf population. And we did so through the mechanism I just talked about. But here then is the question, are they the same species? Okay. Well, you could say, yeah, they're dogs. They're both dogs, right? So all dogs are the same species. Well, really, are regular domestic dogs and wolves the same species? Because they're dogs. Uh, what about bears? Uh, are polar bears and grizzly bears and black bears and other things, spectacled bears, sun bears, things like that, are they all the same species? They're all bears. Well, if you look at a polar bear, think about a polar bear. Go look a picture, at a picture of a polar bear. Compare that to a picture of a black bear, American black bear. And you'll see they're very different in the way they look. And in fact, they really don't live in the same area. And there's no evidence that they've ever interbred. So we classify them as different species. They look wildly different. So they're different species. So 
a species then? Well, we got to get into what is that. But here's my question before we get into what a species is. Are these two dogs the same species? And again, well, yeah, they're dogs. But what about foxes? Foxes are also dogs. Are they the same as wolves? The answer, again, is no. Foxes and wolves are different through the mechanism we'll talk about in a little bit. So what is the definition of species? If we're going to answer this question, we really need to know what that is. Here's the problem. There's no unambiguous definition of species that applies in all cases. The best one, the most objective one, that has the least subjectivity associated with it is what's called the biological species concept, or biospecies. Now, it, this is an important definition. All the pieces to this have to actually be part of this. And this comes from a guy named Ernst Meyer. I've modified it a little bit to be more specific. But here's how Meyer and, and others have defined what a biological species is. A species is a group of organisms that can either actually or potentially interbreed naturally. Okay, stop there. They have to be able to interbreed. Of course, what that means is they can uh, interbreed and have offspring. But what's important is that it has to be natural. In other words, they can mix their genes, but it has to be naturally done. And the reason is that there are ways that we can artificially do this in the laboratory. And exactly where one draws the line between what we can do with different organisms and mix them together is blurry. I mean, for example, although this is probably one that people wouldn't argue is, tr is, is relevant here, but it is definitely relevant, is that there are mice that are walking around in laboratories that are mice-human chimeras, meaning that they have human genes in with their own genes. So does, does that mean that mice and humans are the same? See, because they have mixed genes. It's like they interbred. Well, they didn't really interbreed because it wasn't natural, and that was done entirely art artificially in a laboratory. So that's not interbreeding. So here it has to be natural. The individuals have to recognize each other as the same species and, in fact, breed, physically breed together. Okay? Now, actually or potentially? Now, the reason that that's there is because if you have a group of organisms that are obviously breeding and producing offspring, that's great, but it's also possible that they could be on different continents or one could be out on an island somewhere. Like, for example, let's look at caribou. Caribou is this type of deer that you see up in, the, up in the Arctic. The caribou that are on Greenland are considered the same species as the caribou that are in Canada because even though no caribou are swimming across and probably not even walking across in, on the ice between Greenland and Canada, they are able to interbreed because when we've taken them and put them together, even though it's not, it's, it's not artificially breeding, we put them together in, a, in an opportunity where they can physically breed, they will, and they produce offspring. So that's the idea, is that, is that they could potentially interbreed. Secondly, they have to be able to produce reproductively viable offspring, which means this. When they have a, a baby, that baby has to itself be able to reproduce. It has to be able to reproduce with other individuals within that group. Okay. Now, let me give you an example. If you have two bears that interbreed and have a viable offspring that itself can breed, then we would say those two bears are the same species. That's never happened between polar bears and black bears. So therefore, black bears and polar bears are considered different species. However, we have evidence that it has happened between polar bears and grizzly bears. There have been at least two different instances, probably more by this time, where a hybrid has been demonstrated genetically to be a hybrid between a polar bear and a grizzly bear. So that hybrid appeared to be able to reproduce on its own. Was, they, the one, the two that I know of were killed in, by hunters, but they appeared to have been capable of reproduction. So therefore, polar bears and grizzly bears are to this day considered the same species, even though they look wildly different. What about horses and donkeys? Well, horses and donkeys can reproduce and have a, a, another organism called a mule, but the mule is sterile. So the mule is not, re the horse and donkeys are not reproductively viable because the mule is not reproductively viable. So the point then is that horses and donkeys are almost the same species, but not quite by this definition because their offspring, even though they have them and they're, they're perfectly solid animals, they can't themselves interbreed. And finally, they have to be reproductively isolated from other such groups. What that means is they can't interbreed with other groups naturally. Right? So those are all of the, all of the parts. They're, they're, they can breed with each other, but they can't breed with other groups, and their offspring are viable. 
And that's what makes something a biological species. Okay, now that particular definition is excellent and helpful and useful. The problem is that it can't always be applied. For example, what about fossil species? Right? So let's look at um, fossilized humans and fossilized Neanderthal, modern humans and Neanderthal. Um, are they the same species? Well, that's been an argument for the longest time until recently. And the question was, could they interbreed? And people argued that they couldn't because of the way they looked. They looked sufficiently different to these researchers that they felt that they just look so different they don't really look like the same species. Therefore, they're their own species. They're using a different concept of species in that case. They're using what we call the morpho-species concept or morphological species concept. Morpho, again, means form, not change. So the morphological species concept is that these individuals have the same form. They look sufficiently similar that we call them the same species. And when you're looking at fossilized records, and all you have is fossil records, then this is pretty much the only idea that you've got. Now, if you can compare DNA, then you're starting to talk about so this other concept that your book talks about called the phylogenetic species concept. But the point is that if they look similar enough physically or they look similar enough uh, genetically, then we can say that they're the same or not the same and so on. Okay, now, in the case of the Neanderthal, we now have DNA evidence from Neanderthal. We have the complete DNA uh, genome sequence for Neanderthal, and we can actually solve this problem now with a combination of these two species concepts. All right, but the point is biological species. I want to go back to that. They have to be reproductively viable. They have to be able to produce viable offspring. So let's go back to this picture right here. Can this reproduce with that naturally? Now, yes, it's possible maybe that we could take sperm out of this individual and mix it with the an egg of this individual like they do in in vitro fertilization in human beings and then implant that and blah, blah, blah. That's possible. Maybe. I don't know. But the point is, we can't assume it's possible until we've seen the experiment done successfully. And I have not. I've never seen that experiment done. So I don't know if that's possible. And even if it were possible, that's not what we're talking about. Because what we're talking about here is natural. It has to be natural reproduction. So the point is, will this individual naturally reproduce with this one? Okay, well, now you got two choices. This could be the female, and this could be the male. Okay. And let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, that she survives. Then she gets pregnant, carrying this individual's child, along with her own. Sit back and watch a chihuahua explode. Because the baby is going to be bigger than the mother. So that's not going to work. Okay, so that means this has got to be the male. Okay, so we'll make this one the male and this the female. Okay, so we're going to give him a bouquet of flowers and a ladder. Physically, he cannot reach. So how's that going to work? Well, maybe you can get on a rock, or maybe I mean we can come up with all kinds of things that can happen. But physically, that's so unlikely as to be ridiculous to think that this creature here could physically breed with this creature. All right. So by the biological species concept, they're unable to breed naturally. So you could argue that these are different species, even though they came from the wolf and they're both dogs, they can't reproduce, they can't interbreed. Okay, all right, there's one argument. Here's another one. That's wrong. That's the argument I'm gonna make. That previous argument I just made is wrong. And the reason is this. Can't this individual here breed with a slightly smaller breed, say a Great Dane? And this one breed with a slightly larger breed, say a Dachshund? And then the Great Dane breeds with a slightly smaller breed, and the, and the Dachshund breeds with a slightly larger breed, and then that breeds with a slightly smaller and larger, larger one, until we get animals that are descended from these two individuals that are approximately the same size, or at least not so different that they can't interbreed. And wouldn't those be able to have, to have babies? I don't know. That experiment's never been performed. Until somebody performs the experiment, I don't know what the answer is, and neither do you. You can't say that you know that something's going to happen until you've seen the experiment. So, are these the same species or are they not? Okay, the answer to that question is not the point. The answer to the question is still up in the air. That's the point. It's arguable. That's the point. In tens of thousands of years, we have created from a wolf 
something like this and something like this that looks so different that we can argue about whether or not they are the same species. Give us another 10,000 years. Give us 100,000 years. Give us a million years. Give us 100 million years. 100 million years is nothing in the lifespan of the Earth. What could we do in 100 million years if we've done this in 30,000? What are we capable of doing? When we have on the cusp, we have put it on the cusp of making new species in just a few tens of thousands of years.